What's up, everyone? Welcome back into another episode of Locked On Bucks. And this is going to be an interesting conversation today. But in the preseason, we looked at this roster. The Bucks made a few changes to uh, who they hoped were going to break into the rotation. So we're about a quarter of the way through the season. And we're going to be asking the question about some of these guys that are on the fringe of the rotation. Uh, do the Bucks need to make a move? Are these guys going to break into the rotation and try and make sense of all this stuff? Uh, particularly with the injuries they've had along the way. So uh, you guys picked the topic. Shemi Ojale is on the agenda. So is Jordan War, who we haven't spoken about for a little bit. And he was the buzz player at the start of the season. So I think this is going to be a fascinating chat. Uh, let's get into it. You are Locked On Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Bucks. I'm your host, Kane Pittman. You can see me and hear me on this show daily and also find my work over at ESPN Australia and joining me from the Bucks Radio Network, uh, the shoe man, as you can see the shoes in the in the background there, Justin Garcia. Uh, you know, I, I introduce you every time now, but you've been on this show enough. You're just, uh, just part of the furniture like me, like Frank, uh, Justin. But before we dive into it, today's episode is brought to you by True Bill. True Bill is a new app that saves you money by helping you identify and stop paying for the subscriptions you don't want or need and can even negotiate better deals on those you want to keep. We'll talk a bit more about True Bill later in the show. Uh, as always, we thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen of every single day. And I tweeted it out this morning, Justin. I said, okay, what, what's on your mind, Bucks fans? We're, uh, you know, like I said, nearly a quarter of the way through the season. The Bucks are 10 and 8, four game win streak, starting to feel like things are becoming a little more normal. But there's still endless questions with this team and what it looks like. And it's such a weird feeling. And we've been doing this for a couple of years now when we look at this team and everything is through the lens of the playoffs. But sometimes I still find myself finding that situation a little bit weird when we talk about the regular season. It's like, like okay. What's this going to look like in the playoffs? But it's what this team is doing. They've been playing the long game for quite a while. But before we do that, you tweeted out a stat. When was the last time the Bucks? I don't want to jinx anything here with the streak they've got going with the Pistons. When the hell was the last time this team had a 5-0 and homestand? I can't even believe this. What was it? it was uh I think February of it, 1980 and I think it was in February of 80 that so it's been over 40 years and as they won last night I was um in the transition from doing the net the radio on the network into the post game show that we do locally starting to think of you know when's the last time they went perfect on a home stand that was this long and started to go through year by year and it took me a while to act, to find it. And then uh, this morning, I actually got a text from Eric Kolbeck with the Bucks saying, hey, I heard you talking about this last night. What was the date that you found? And I told him, you know, actually, I was going to ask you to cross-reference this to make sure I was accurate. But, yeah, it's been over 40 years. Now, they have had longer win streaks at home. They've had perfect home stands before, but it's just kind of – the strangeness you and I were talking about it in the schedule. I mean, you would think this would have happened two years ago when they had the 18 game home or win streak, but they never had a home stand longer than like three games during that stretch. Absolute road warriors. That's crazy. So I guess in that game or in that win streak, I'm guessing Marcus Johnson would have been a part of that, uh, which is funny because yeah. last night I tweeted uh, that the Bucks that was a, the biggest margin, the 41 point margin at half time was the biggest since 19 it was the biggest in franchise history it's before big, yeah. that uh the biggest halftime margin was 38 points and i did have someone tweet that marcus johnson started in that game as well so marcus just involved in all the stats as he often is those teams were so good uh, during the 80s so it's not a surprise but one thing that we've spoken about uh with the standings as i bring them up here on the screen is why this was such a big opportunity for the bucks so as we see right now they're currently the seven seed they're 10 and 8 but there's a log jam it's super super close and I was listening, and this was what this was what sort of caught my attention. I was listening to the uh, low post earlier this morning. Zach Lowe and Kevin Arnovitz were on there, and they were talking about the Chicago Bulls and what a great start to the season it's been, and they're a fantastic team, and everyone's kind of maybe underestimated what they could potentially be. And as you can see here in the standings, the Bucks are two games 
two games behind the Chicago Bulls. And it's been a disastrous start for the Bucs. It's been yeah. terrible. And they're two games behind. They win a couple more games here. Uh, they can sort of sort of leapfrog the Bulls. And that was the point Zach Lowe made. He said, well, I think I'm underestimating the Bulls. But at the same time, if they lose two games next week in a row, uh, they might be in the eighth seed. And then all of a sudden, that's where we thought they were going to be. So uh, there's been so many factors involved with that when it comes to health, when it comes to injuries. We've spoken about the Philadelphia 76ers who have just had a dreadful run. Uh, these last couple of weeks and now they've dropped right back into standings but it feels like this is the way it's going to go this season with the health and safety protocols and all those things i'm sure the bucks are going to get caught up in in that again at some point uh but you know for all the are uh, we should be panicking about the bucks what's going to happen you look at the standings; it's all pretty bunched up yeah and i think what really uh benefited the bucks is number one uh something like this where you start to get healthier and um, you do it where you have a stretch in the schedule where it's five straight at home. And none of those teams that they played on the homestead will be um, seventh or higher in their conference that the Lakers were the highest, but even the thunder were, I think eighth in the Western conference at the time that these two teams played. And also three of the five teams on this schedule for the bucks are in the bottom five in terms of offense in the league too. So that's helping your defense get right as well that you can kind of ease guys into the mix but you look at the eastern conference and as this was all starting to come together for the bucks for the last two weeks or so outside of the nets and then the pistons and the magic it seems like every team has been basically 500 for that stretch that if you look at the last 10 too most of them are five and five or six and six so that's allowed the bucks to start to climb where one day you look and they're 11th and then all of a sudden, here they are in this log jam of what four teams I think that are at ten and eight and tied for sixth. You win tomorrow, and you're tied with the Charlotte Hornets pending their results. So, uh, before you know it, they're probably going to be in the top four and top three by the time we get to middle of next week. Yeah, I just while you were uh, reading out those numbers or going through to the process here for the Bucks, I, I wanted to look up. I didn't get a chance to look up their advanced numbers or their offensive efficiency, defensive efficiency based on what we saw last night. Uh, Frank pointed to the fact that he was he was starting to rub his hands together thinking, geez, if they win this game by 55 points, this is going to be pretty nice. Uh, the Bucks are actually up to 16th in offense, 14th in defense, and 12th net rating. I think I, I just looked at it there. But anyway, it's the, they're trending in the right direction. I mean, it was only a week ago again. And look, yeah, you can you can beef up those numbers by playing some terrible teams. But uh, last week, they were in the 20s for all of those. So we'll see uh, how that trends in the next week. Certainly having a guy like Chris Milton back in the lineup helps just the general rotation. All of a sudden, there aren't too many lineups where you're just like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if these are the guys that I want to see out on the floor. So that's been nice. Um, before we get into talking about Shemi Ojale and Jordan War and all these guys, uh, you I, I mentioned the shoes, but you are a, a shoe guy, would you say? I, I, I would say sure okay so we had when i sent this tweet out asking people uh let us know what your thoughts are in the season uh, i had a tweet from ash uh ingridson who's who said uh something and, and i don't have it up here but it was something about the the freak threes it's the, they're weird or there's something wrong and i've had a number of people tweet this to me and about Giannis playing in the ones yeah, I, I just, and I know nothing about shoes, so I wouldn't even be able to tell you if what what's wrong with them, why they look funny. Is there something weird about them? So is there? I don't know. Well, he went he went back to the threes last night, but I was almost inclined to go down on the court. Um, I, I saw our friend Nick Monroe, and I was going to go down there and take one of the Nick Monroe shots of Giannis's freak threes that he was wearing, just because that had been the talking point, and you noticed it once of like that's weird. Why? Like, that's a different colorway that I've seen. And then you see, oh, no, it's actually his first. And then I think it was two or three games that he wore them. So when I saw him wearing the threes last night, I almost wanted to take a picture just to put people at ease and say, hey, FYI, he's warming up in the threes. So don't worry. There's no issue with these. It's just Giannis doing Giannis things here. Wearing the ones one week. I'm sure we'll see him wear the twos at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I guess this is what you can do when you've got multiple versions of your own shoes. So uh, good good luck to him for that. Shout out to him for that. But yeah, if you've tweeted at me in the last couple of weeks something about Giannis's shoes and I've just completely ignored you, I want you all to know that I, I saw the tweets. 
I just literally didn't know what to say. I, I had no response. There's there's nothing for me to say about that. But there you go. Justin's let you know. Back in the threes last night. So if you've you purchased threes and you're wondering if you should uh, swap back to the ones for your pickup run, I, I think it's going to be okay. I think that you can uh, be okay with the threes there. All right. I want that. Look at- I, I will say this real quick though. I have one of each of the models, and the ones are my preferred as well. So I can understand why he was wearing the ones for a couple of games. Maybe maybe he just wanted to get the ones back on the on the radar, you know, just boost the sales of all three shoes. You know, he's a salesman. He's a salesman. There's no doubt about that. Uh, speaking of uh, sales, if and this honestly, I, I swear this happens all the time. But I'll I'll sign up for some subscription and I'll completely forget about it, and then I'll get the the text, the email that I've been charged again, and it's annoying. It's happened with gyms before as well. It's it's an absolute joke. But True Bill can help you with that. True Bill is a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to 720 bucks per year with True Bill. Uh, because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, True Bill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and True Bill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your True Bill, True Bill concierge is there when you need them. Uh, to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. Uh, Truebill has over 2 million users and has helped them save over 100 million bucks. Don't fall for subscription scams. scams. Start canceling today at truebill.com slash locked on NBA. Go right now, truebill.com slash locked on NBA. could save you thousands a year. That's truebill.com slash locked on NBA. And really, I mean, just think about it. If you're saving thousands a year, imagine how many built bars you could buy with that. I mean, that is just the absolute dream. Our friend, our central division friend, Ku Khalil, uh, had tweeted out a video today. He got a built bar uh, delivery. And if you want to see happiness in one man's eyes, go to go to Ku's uh, Twitter account because uh, that's what built bar will do for you. Particularly leading into Thanksgiving, we're a couple of days away here. So uh, as we've been saying all the time, look, pie is not good for you. Swap the pie. Just put a built bar on the plate. Everyone's going to be happy. There'll be no family arguments. It's just going to be a good time for all. Particularly if you have a mix of all the flavors, then everyone's going to be happy. They're low calorie, low carb, low fat, high protein, and covered in 100% chocolate. Built is a great option when you're hungry. If Thanksgiving isn't coming soon enough, Go for a Built Bar or two. You better hurry up, I'll tell you, because it is coming soon enough. It's in a couple of days. But just go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Uh, like we said, thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen of every single day, particularly coming into the holiday period. You know, you just uh, chuck Locked On Bucks on. You might be cooking have some friends over, then people will be like, oh, man, why is this like random Australian talking about the Milwaukee Bucks? Then they'll subscribe to Locked On Bucks. So you're really going to be helping us out. Uh, there's no doubt about that. We spoke about Shemi Ojale at the end of yesterday's show. Justin, the the release came through from the Bucks three weeks at least. He's going to be reevaluated in three weeks, which is not good, particularly when you consider that this has been a really, really rough start for Shemi Ojale. And again, that's acknowledged the fact that he came in with an injury concern with that calf, missed the entire preseason. So I've been someone who's wanting to be patient, wanting to be you know, lenient for a guy trying to fit in a new system, new roster where the lineups have been disastrous half the time. So I haven't been able to be too critical. But this is just terrible for the Bucks trying to figure out if this guy is going to be someone you can play. It's kind of, it kind of makes any decision making for the future a little bit difficult. Yeah, I I um I feel bad for Shemi in a couple of regards. I mean, first and foremost, that we we already started to see the narrative over the summer of people looking at Shemi Ojale and looking at his size and profile, and oh well, this is the PJ Tucker replacement. And we've seen they're very there are some similarities, but there's differences as well. But I, I don't know if you had a chance to hear Bobby after the game last night, but I thought what Bobby had to say is pretty much something you can apply to Shemi Ojale, and that. I, I wouldn't say it under it explains all of the struggles, but I think we can kind of chalk up a lot of it to what Bobby Portis was talking about in that, you know, he played a little bit in that scrimmage and then he had the hamstring issue and it cost him all of camp, all of the preseason, well into the season before he came back. And even then there was, uh, you know, he and Shemi returning at the same time and trading off on back to backs and still kind of easing them into the mix that Bobby was basically talking about you know, my, my ramp up period was gone and I had no camp to get ready for. And I had no, a preseason where I could use this to work on some things that 
you know, it's it's been a slow process, and I feel like I'm starting to finally just round the corner there. And you know, I think you can definitely say the same for Shemi Ojale that all of that applies. And oh, by the way, learn a new system, offense and defense, learn new teammates. And now he has another setback with this injury. So, you know, I don't think what we've seen from Shemi Ojale so far is necessarily the finished product and what he's going to be. It's just frustrating. And I know it is for him too, that now it's going to be even more of an on-ramp for him. And it's going to take some time before you really, really know what you have here in Shemi Ojale. Maybe the benefit is by the time he does return, I think we're assuming Brooke Lopez will have returned as well based off kind of everything you're piecing together and reading the tea leaves here, that now this team will start to fall into place a little more. And Shemi Ojale is, is stepping into what we assume his his role with this team is going to be. So ultimately it could be a good thing, but it's a frustrating start to his Bucks career for sure. Yeah, so I've got a couple of tweets here and and a lot of what you guys – uh, responded was sort of heading down the same path. I think a lot of people are, are asking the same questions. They might not necessarily have the same answer, but everyone's in the same direction. So if I don't have your tweet, I definitely saw him, but I just pulled out uh, these two here. So this comes from M- MEB at Sixth and Juno. He says, uh, Shemi, Thanasis, War, Rodney, all player to be acquired. The thing we didn't know before the season started, the most obvious piece needing replacing we appear to be no closer to knowing, or maybe we are closer to knowing that guy isn't on the roster. So, the, and this is really the question, but the the problem for me when I'm trying to say, okay, well, uh, do the Bucks need to add someone to play in those lineups that we've discussed? It, essentially, you can call it the PJ role, whatever you want it. This is the big question for me moving forward, but I can't really say that, well, they should make a trade, they should do this, these are the guys that would put up for a trade until you know what you got with Brooke because that then becomes the obvious addition that you need to make to the roster. And for me, well, and we've been through this, but to me, the nine guys that you have in the rotation, Giannis, Chris, Drew, Brooke, Grayson, Dante, uh, George Hill, Pat Connor, and Bobby Portis, there's nine guys. That's a playoff rotation. That's fine. Now, in that's in a perfect world that everyone's healthy. We'll wait and see. But on paper, I like it. The wild cards that we had before the season that we didn't know a lot about, Jordan Wara, Shemi Ojale, Rodney Hood, and Thanasis, they're still kind of on the outside looking in. None of those guys have done anything to me that says, okay, they should be in a playoff rotation if the playoffs started today. That's just me. I haven't seen anything. My concern with Shemi Ojale, when you say, can he potentially be a guy that played that role for PJ? First of all, I think it's unfair that to suggest that he could be the guy that comes in and plays on a Kevin Durant. So if he can't do that, and if PJ Tucker couldn't do that, the question I'm asking is, would he have been on the floor last year? I I don't know. Maybe because Dante wasn't there, but we've, we've said before, what happened if Dante was there? Would PJ have started? Would Bud still have pulled the trigger? Who knows? I'm not sure what would have happened there, but if you just look at the offensive rating with, with Shemi on the floor, I mean, this year it's been obviously disastrous, but again, He's played with some crazy lineups, so I'm not putting this on him. But this year, it's been at 98.3, which is obviously ugly. In 2021, uh, with Boston, and again, he was sort of in and out of the rotation, but uh, the team was better from a net rating perspective when he was off the floor, and the offensive rating when he was on was 107.6, which is middling. I mean, it's it's not... Yeah, I mean, it's not great. The year before, it was 104.6. So I guess if you have a guy that isn't really going to do anything offensively other than shoot the open three. You would put him in a playoff rotation because you thought he could lock down a guy. And, and I I don't, you know, I'm just not sure whether he's a guy that you're going to sacrifice an offensive piece to put him on the floor. I'm just not sure that he's that guy. And, And by the way, he's on a minimum contract. Like, we, 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 it was best case scenario that he was going to be PJ Tucker. So again, it's not a knock on him and it, I, I don't. I'm not basing that on what we've seen on the floor so far. We'll see what happens long term, but I, I'm just not sure that that he's going to fit that that role. So then you ask the question: Okay, well, is that someone you need to acquire, or do you like the guys you've got on the roster that you can slide up? Dante, go small, Pat, these types of players. That's probably the question. Yeah, I, I just um, this year is going to be tough because again, for for as much as it was easy to just look at the two players in a vacuum and say, well, Shemi Ojale should be the PJ Tucker replacement. This is not meant as a knock on Shemi Ojale, but I think the trepidation was always show me where he did it in the playoffs that, I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, Hey, this guy 
has some lateral quickness and some good size that you would look to defensively that we think he could fill that in. But it wasn't just that from P.J. Tucker. It was how the team rebounded with him on the court, him making some of those plays, his basketball IQ. And Shemi Ojale hasn't had to go through that and, and hasn't displayed that in the playoffs through his career. So I, I lean towards, you know, this guy isn't on the roster right now. But to your point, we don't know how the health of Dante DiVincenzo would have impacted things last year. We've seen Giannis get some more reps at the five this year. It's obviously not ideal, but that doesn't mean this team can't play small a lot of times where you think about the players they do have. And I know, you know, having guys like PJ allowed you to play small because of what he was able to do. But, you know, we've seen Pat Connaughton play small ball for we've seen Dante DiVincenzo be one of the better rebounding guards in the league and, and able to defend some positions up from him that this team has that versatility. So I think they are capable of playing smaller with Giannis at the five and throwing you know, Chris and Pat and Dante and Drew out there because these are guys that can play multiple positions. But, you know, in terms of what they do, I don't think any of us have any answers for that until we start to get close to the second half of the season and the trade deadline. But even then, what do they really have that they can do at the trade deadline? I mean, you mentioned guys like Shemi. Those are minimum contracts. Everybody's going to point to Dante DiVincenzo, but you're not – maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe you disagree, but you're not trading Dante DiVincenzo at the trade deadline just because, for one, it's all about recouping assets if you do decide to move on from him that – you would sign him in the offseason. It would be a part of a sign and trade. So you could bring on a larger salary in return. If you move on from Dante now, you're limiting yourself to what you can bring back. So I think really it's looking at the buyout market. And one of the issues right now is when you look at those teams that we can already pencil in and say, well, these teams are playing for nothing that let's kind of start to circle this roster and see who they could potentially cut loose here. Most of it is wing players, that there's not a whole lot of, of, of forward depth that would help you. I think the one guy to, I guess, keep an eye on as a potential buyout, depending on what happens with the Spurs, is what happens with Thaddeus Young, because that's a guy that seems like he would make a lot of sense to help you out there. Other than that, it, it's just kind of we got to wait and see what happens in terms of player movement, what are the buyouts, and what happens with the rest of the conference, because they may be able to get by with playing small a lot of times when you look at the teams – at the top with the Nets. If the Bulls stick around, they're playing small a lot of the time that there aren't really those behemoths anymore outside of Joel Embiid in the Eastern Conference. So if I had to make a bet, it would be that John Horst is monitoring the situation based on what we've seen in previous years. This guy is uh, always willing uh, to make a move. So that would be my bet. But if you want to bet on football or basketball, anything around the Thanksgiving period, uh, you can do that at betonline.ag that has you covered for all holiday season. More props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this Thanksgiving. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus with the promo code Locked On to receive your bonus. Uh, it's not just football or basketball. There's also, well, the college hoops, in addition to NHL, boxing, UFC, and favorite Vegas ca casino games as well. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. That's bet online. We are stuffed with deals this Thanksgiving. So you mentioned the trade stuff, and and again, I, th I think it's yeah. I mean, it's important to note if you're dreaming big in the trade scenario, um, maybe maybe you need to relax a little bit just because again. Uh, the guys that you think, okay, would there be any interest in these these players around the league? Dante DiVincenzo. I did see someone mention Marvin Bagley. Now, listen, uh, the Kings wanted Dante at one point. So if you're really desperate to do that, then maybe you will. But this tweet here, uh, sorry, we've already seen that one. This tweet here uh, from our uh, friend Biento, who, by the way, always brings the passion on Twitter. So, you know, you do that, uh, you'll get on the show from time to time. He says, Bucks fans who think Grayson is better than Dante are delusional and are overrating Grayson, especially on the defensive end. Grayson is great, but Dante is better and should start and finish games. So this is one of the big questions moving forward. Uh, will Dante DiVincenzo move into the starting lineup? I've been pretty strong on the fact that, you know, when you don't see him for a while, he's out of sight, out of mind. You might have forget, you might have forgotten the, the types of things that he brings to this team, particularly with how well Grayson's been playing. But I personally can't wait to see Dante uh, back in the lineup. But Jordan War is a fascinating case this season because obviously he came out hot. He had an excellent Olympic campaign. Uh, he's honestly the type of guy that I feel like if he was in a bad team, 
he would be getting you 16, 18 points, maybe yeah. 20 points a night. He could do that. Unfortunately, the efficiency has been pretty awful so far this season, particularly for mid-range. I mean, he's been, I think it's in the low 30s, his percentage from the mid-range, and he's not shy about taking those shots. Uh, his three-point percentage is down at 34%. He's basically doubled the volume per game that he was getting up uh, last year as well. So, you know, the three-point percentage is fine. I mean, he'll, he'll probably level out as a guy that's in the high 30s or mid to high 30s. That seems where he'll be, particularly because he does take some tough shots. Funnily enough, his rim, his percentage at the rim has gone up at 70% this season compared with 50% last year, uh, but he is only taking 19% of his shots at the rim compared with 27 last year. So the volume's gone down a little bit. And I do think part of that, honestly, is the fact that he's playing with starters more. So I, then I was thinking to myself, okay, well, how much did this guy play with Giannis last year? So, so far this year, he's played 154 minutes with Giannis on the floor. How many minutes do you think he played with Giannis last season? All right, so it's either more than that or it's a lot less based on the way you're setting it up. I'm inclined to think it's a lot less just because it seems like Jordan Wara's moments last year were those games that the Bucks basically punted where it was Brooke Lopez was the only regular. So I would say he played 27 minutes with Giannis last year. Damn, that's pretty good. 23. So, yeah, so 154 this season, only 23 last season. And, you know, I, I saw some people saying, well, you know, Jordan's in the doghouse. Ah, oh, this, uh, you know, he, you know, Bud's angry with him. And look, from time to time, maybe he's made some plays, some poor passes, some poor decisions where he did get benched for that. That's fine. But it's also just the fact that guys are back. Guys are back and guys are playing. I mean, that's, that's the simple answer to me. I don't see anything outside of that. Again, we've spoken about the fact that you know, he needs to work on some other things. And I think that we've seen effort defensively. Certainly, yeah. uh, you know, he's had some moments on, on the defensive end of the floor, but it's going to be hard for him to crack in uh, to the rotation. And, and just, just those numbers there are, are just fascinating. I mean, he's been put in situations he wasn't in beforehand, but I just don't know what he can do to sort of, so he's not going to eat into Pat's minutes. He's not going to eat into those those minutes at the wing now that now that Chris is there. Dante hopefully comes back. He's not going to be ahead of him. So it's just a tough situation. Do I think that Jordan War is a guy that people around the league have taken notice of as a as a potential scorer? Absolutely. But uh, I I don't know. I, I don't really know what else to say about Jordan War other than I think he's talented, but it's going to be tough when you're on a contender. Yeah, I mean it, it's it, the opportunities are are only really going to be there when this team is dealing with injuries or on a back-to-back and, and things of that nature where you're resting. I mean, this is the defending champion that we're talking about, and they have a lot of depth on the wing. So it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for Jordan Wara to operate. And I've, you know, I've been impressed with, you touched on the effort defensively. Um, I think he's impressed all of us there. We've seen Jordan Wara defending shots at the rim, which has really surprised me. I think there are some components to his game offensively that have regressed a little bit in the last couple of weeks, but it's easy to explain when he's gone from playing very heavy minutes to slowly you reintroduce Drew Holiday and then Chris comes back and Bobby, that all of these guys one by one where you could have slotted them in, those minutes are starting to get taken away. So you do get the sense that at times he's pressing and trying to you know stand out a little bit, but that's all part of being a young player. And honestly, that's what's kind of impressed me with Grayson Allen, too, is we knew those opportunities and the volume for him is going to start to come down when Chris came back and everybody else is starting to return here. And he's found ways to, I guess, stay relevant and important within the offense that, you know, he's been in double figures, I think, four or three of the four games since Chris returned. And he's hit some big shots. So that's going to be big for him as well, especially once Dante comes back and how that changes his role. Yeah, absolutely. So let us know what you think about Jordan War. Should he be playing? How would he be playing? What do you want to do? So uh, again, I know that the first thing that everyone wants to talk about is trades and how can you trade to make the roster better. You know, we've spoken about the fact if if they have the inkling that Brook Lopez is is potentially a major question mark moving forward, that might change the calculus. So we'll see. But I just don't see anything happening uh, anytime soon. Certainly not before. Uh, sort of the month of February when, and the trade deadline. It just doesn't make sense because so much can change uh, before that time. And uh, as we mentioned right at the top, the Bucks are starting to roll a little bit now. So if they get these guys back and they're winning games, then you sort of feel that there's uh, you, you can ride this out and see how this, this plays out uh, moving forward. I should mention the Locked On Bets podcast before we close up today. You can make 
the Locked On Bets uh, podcast, your second listen of the day. It's your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. It's free and available on all platforms. Uh, let's hope the streak continues against uh, Detroit tomorrow and we can get that 5-0 and road trip, improve to 11-8, and maybe up into the top four or five in the Eastern Conference as well. That sounds like a pretty good a Thanksgiving treat for Bucks fans. I mean, look, we I hope we don't jinx it that we both said sooner or later the streak is going to end, but it's it's a fact. It's what it, it's uh not only the the piston streak in general, but it's what I want to say 35 straight, maybe 36 now against the division when Giannis plays in the game that the Bucks have won. So there's a lot out there in the Bucks favor for this game against the Pistons. The other uh, one real quick thing I'd say too, is it's going to be interesting to see the second half of the season and how teams approach this because the trade deadline is earlier again this year. And I think it's in early February. And uh, again, with the play in tournament and the way the Eastern conference is too, there's more teams that are trying to make the playoffs. So there's going to be less teams that are just going to give up and trade some assets. So I don't know what that means for the trade market. We both kind of said the Bucks don't have very many options as is with their cap situation, but there may be less teams that are looking to deal some pieces that it, it may only be buyout market. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, this is one of the being one of the strange things or the fun things is the Bucks have become a contender. They're actually in the buyout market and players might look at the Bucks and say, oh, you want me to go to the defending champs? I'll do that. So we'll see. It, uh, they haven't had a major fish from from that sort of uh inclusion oh, you're this not point. you're not counting Paul Gasol as a major fish well I mean a big name I was I was certainly very excited to to be around him uh but no uh, that one didn't quite work out Bucks legend well, Marvin Pelican. Williams was decent the bubble was weird you know yeah but he, he was impactful though I wonder if Marvin Williams as we get distracted here at the end of the show as we always do Got anything left well what well I I just wonder if Marvin Williams decided that he wanted to play last year which i think we were all surprised that he kind of surprised that he retired yeah if he came back and played for the bucks would they have traded for pj tucker i mean so many so many strange things that could have happened potentially it wouldn't have maybe marvin would have been washed and they would have done it anyway who knows well i mean even the the drew holiday trade the the whole dante thing too if that bogdan bogdanovich trade goes through they don't get pj tucker because uh Urson was a part of the deal and dj wilson was a part of the deal so you don't have anything to bring back that salary ah well it all worked out it all worked out for everyone for all concerned which we're very thankful for but uh let's wrap it up before we keep waffling on here for too long so bucks and pistons uh tonight probably as you're listening to this wednesday night uh then there's no basketball on thanksgiving so I don't know if I'm going to be able to rope anyone in to do a pod. Everyone will be with, you know, eating or with family or friends or whatever they do, watching football. So we'll see. But there will be a post-game pod tomorrow, and then we'll figure out the rest of the week as it comes. But for Justin and myself, we'll leave it there. We'll catch you guys tomorrow.